first event of LGBTQ History Month at the library. Um, a little housekeeping before we start, if you're not familiar with the, um, the setup of this platform. If you have any questions for any of the panelists during the event, you can submit those using the question box below. A selection of questions will be answered towards the end of the event when we have a bit more of a come together and a conversation. Please use the menu above to provide us with feedback about the event and it's also a place where you can donate to the library um, if you feel that that's something that you can do at the moment. Your support helps us to open up the world's knowledge and inspire as many people as possible to engage with, with, with the written word. Um, you can also find a bookshop tab where you can buy books, which will be mentioned throughout the course of this event. Um, one of the um, participants in that is Gaze the Word Bookshop, who are uh, Britain's longest running LGBTQ book, book, bookshop. Um, you'll also find um, social media links below this video in case you want to continue the conversation on other platforms. You can also find the biographies of all of our speakers tonight and the event description. Um, so this event is called Reflections, Gay Liberation Front of 50. And as a queer person born in 1980, uh, I was of a generation directly impacted by legislation such as Clause 28, um, which prohibited local authorities from talking about or promoting homosexuality anyway, including in libraries. And the library in the early 1990s in the small northeastern town where I lived was the place where I could go to try and find myself hidden in indexes and paragraphs of literature. Um, but in my view, it's largely thanks to the work of the Gay Liberation Front during the 1970s and the subsequent generations of LGBTQ activists that I'm in this incredible position of privilege that I am at the moment, where I'm able to talk to you tonight as a representative of the British Library. I first encountered Gay Liberation Front on a Saturday afternoon in 2010 at a cinema in Notting Hill. It was the 40th anniversary of Gay Liberation Front. And the programme of events that day was fiercely interrupted by a humorous, angry, passionate debate about the treatment of Gay Liberation Front activists by civil liberty groups and local authorities at the time. And the thing that I took away from that event was the work of the GLF was in no way over and it was in no way history. And I left that event with my 40th anniversary edition of the Gay Liberation Front Manifesto, um, which included a paragraph by one of its co-authors, a writer called Elizabeth Wilson. And I'm going to um, quote some of that for you now. The manifesto reads today as a fairly one dimensional attempt to account for gender and sexual victimization. However, it asks an important question and one that is still relevant about the sources of prejudice and hatred. The Gay Liberation Front Manifesto group met in my basement living room throughout a rather hot summer. The atmosphere was often tense and febrile, but however black and white the answers we developed might appear today, it seemed crucial at that time to understand better the nature of the society that we lived in and continue to live in. If it seems both raw and oversimplified now, it did actually, along with the work of feminists, spark a way of thinking about human relationships and society that has led to significant social change. Like all pioneers, we sometimes got it wrong, but we believed in what we were doing. We believed in our power to change society, and that is surely a good thing." End quote. That was Elizabeth Wilson. So the British Library was hoping to be able to help everybody to uh, engage with the legacy of Gay Liberation Front by having a case dedicated to the printed material of the Gay Liberation Front um, in our treasures gallery. So the Gay Liberation Front manifesto, its newspaper come together and its various pamphlets um, would be alongside Magna Carta, um, St. Cuthbert, the, the, the Gutenberg Bible and various literary manuscripts from, from renowned authors. And um, that case sadly was canceled um, due to um, COVID-19 um, in the summer of 2020. It was re rescheduled for February this year, but unfortunately that has also been postponed. But do keep an eye out on our upcoming exhibition program where we will be commemorating the Gay Liberation Front very, very soon. We can't go into the entire history of Gay Liberation Front tonight, um, but by way of brief introduction, GLF was founded by two students, Bob Mellers and Aubrey Walter, 
who traveled to America independently of each other during the summer of 1970. Um, what they encountered in America um, was um, uh, a, a country in, the, in following the events of the, the Stonewall Uprising uh, in uh, July 1969, June, July 1969. Aubrey and um, Bob actually met in Philadelphia at the Black Panthers uh, uh, Party's Revolutionary People's Constitutional Convention. And it was there um, that they joined one of the gay liberation groups and brought all of that information that they gained in Philadelphia via that conference to London and um, began meeting at the London School of Economics in October 1970. Um, the group grew from 20, which morphed into 18, which morphed into hundreds of activists, which spawned consciousness raising sessions, newspapers, pamphlets, phone lines, discos, demonstrations, communes, street theater, marches, and the legacy of GLF goes on long after 1973 when they stopped organizing. So tonight our first speaker, we're trying to keep it as GLF as possible by giving everybody a platform for a set amount of time and then we'll all come together and have a conversation later. Um, so our first speaker tonight is uh, Stuart Feather. Stuart encountered GLF in its first month of meetings. Um, he was a participant in street theater um, and Stuart was arrested dressed as uh, Mary Whitehouse um, in one of the more infamous GLF actions around the fundamentalist Christian organization, the Festival of Light during 1971. Um, Stuart, I'm gonna give the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> well, um, I went along to Gay Liberation Front. I heard about it uh, through two friends of mine and my then boyfriend who had gone out shopping in Oxford Street and returned with a pamphlet from the Gay Liberation Front asking them to join. And so we decided to go. And I had read a tiny little two paragraph article, I think in the Sunday Times uh, the year previously. And uh, it, taught, it mentioned the Gay Liberation Front um, and uh, I thought that was a bit strange because I, I didn't know how, uh, what gay liberation could mean really. I mean, I'd heard about the Palestinian Labor Liberation Front and the, uh, the Liberation Front of the Western Sahara. Um, so uh, this was my opportunity. Um, and along we went and we entered this classroom at the London School of Economics and it was quite crowded with all these young people. I was 30 at the time, they were in their 20s or some even younger than that. And all the men were kind of, uh, had long hair and, and indeed some of them were, were wearing very sort of hippie outfits with, um, you know, uh, Afghan coats and, and stuff like that. Uh, the women uh, were, more my age. There, there was some very young lesbians there, um, but um, and uh, the thing that got me was that one of the women stood up and, and addressed us newcomers and said, um, "How uh, I want you to think about how you behave at work in order." to disguise your sexuality. And suddenly I had this vision of all the games that I played to do just that. And I felt rather disgusted by it. Um, and um, that made me kind of realize how much of my behavior had been in a way forced on me by society. And uh, so that uh, became uh, uh, the motive uh, for joining the Gay Liberation Front and for discovering that, you know, the personal is political. Um, a few months later, um, uh, around about Christmas time, um, there was a gay liberation function group formed uh, called the Street Theatre Group. 
And I thought, well, I've done some amateur dematics and I, uh, I haven't been able to find any other function group in GLF that I uh, that appealed to me, or oh, I felt capable of contributing to. But with the street theatre group, I did. And so I joined. And uh, thanks to Angela here, uh, who came along to Gay Liberation, um, she invited us to um, perform uh, or demonstrate um, for and on behalf of the women of women's liberation who'd been arrested at the Albert Hall after demonstrating against the Miss World contest in 1970. And so my first experience of um, performing on the pavement was that event. Uh, and uh, I was also, well, a lot of us were in drag. Certainly I was. Uh, and um, it uh, proved um, really amazing. We got such a crowd around us um, and uh, the BBC were there with their cameras. Um, I, th I think we, all, we were all left on the cutting room floor uh, because after the event, we all rushed back to um, Paul Theobald's place where we'd sort of got together and uh, got our costumes on and things. And we sat all day waiting for it to appear on the news and it didn't. Um, there were reasons for that, but um, there we are. Uh, the, the other thing was that I kind of got the feeling of how strong uh, drag is in affecting people and how antagonistic they can get. I mean, uh, we did a second performance at Bo outside Bow Street Magistrates Court and we had the Covent Garden porters coming and, uh, and throwing rotten tomatoes at us. And because we were in the now and hadn't done any rehearsal and had no structure, we kind of uh, couldn't carry on. We, we, we kind of lost it because of that um, lack of discipline, if you like. So we retreated um, and grabbed our things and, and got away. Um, and I remained with the street theatre group um, well, uh, for uh, the rest of my time in the Gay Liberation Front. Um, I, uh, my progress because of the politics of, of, of Gay Liberation uh, meant that um, I began to meet other people who thought the same way as I did. And um, so I became um, a drag queen and eventually a hippie commie drag queen living in a commune in Notting Hill. Um, one of the, and I took part as Stephen's already said, dressed as Mary Whitehouse in this big demonstration we held against the group called the Festival of Light organized by such um, moral leaders as Mary Whitehouse and Lord Longford and Malcolm Muggeridge and Cliff Richard. And they held an, an inaugural meeting in uh, the Methodist Central Hall, which we disrupted time and time again, little groups doing things in the middle of someone's speech, letting off uh, letting off mice which scattered around the floor and freaked people out, others standing up and kissing each other in the middle of the church, all same-sex couples. Um, and, uh, uh, and the nuns, we had nuns there who uh, did a can-can all the way down the aisle uh, before they were caught by the stewards and thrown out. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine and a sister communard um, dressed as uh, an American, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, evangelist woman who believed in being saved and suddenly stood up and announced that in the middle of Malcolm Muggeridge's speech. And she was so effective that people actually thought for a moment, you could feel it, that they thought for a moment it was real. And uh, uh, 
uh, and of course he was grabbed as well and, and whisked off. Uh, but and the final act was the action group of the Gay Liberation Front getting into the basement of the Central Hall Westminster and turning uh, half the hall's lights off. And uh, the, the um, headline, or not the headline, but uh, the, in the article uh, in The Guardian the next day was, um, you know, um, about the lights being turned off uh, in the middle of this uh, evangelical meeting. Um, and then they had a, um, a big rally in Trafalgar Square, followed by a march and an even bigger rally in Hyde Park a couple of weeks later, uh, which is when the police came along and they were now um, you know, looking for demonstrators who were going to be protesting against them, the Festival of Light. And uh, we were and we were told uh, after singing all things bright and beautiful in front of St. Martin's, um, St. Martin in the Fields Church, uh, that we were part of the Angry Brigade, which is a group of um, uh, Cambridge students who uh, were um, fighting the government uh, using um, explosives um, and their aim was to damage property. Unfortunately, no one ever got uh, maimed or injured in any way or killed, which would have been even worse. Um, and uh, we, we just couldn't believe it. And then they divided us and pushed us up against the plinth of the uh, Nelson's column and the only way out of that was to climb up the plinth and there was Mary Whitehouse on the north side of the plinth, um, you know, uh, with all the other uh, big people uh, and sing they were all singing hymns and rallying all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were all screaming, Jesus saves, Jesus saves over and over again. It was really manic. Um, and... Uh, we were pulled off and a lot of us were arrested. I managed to escape with one or two others to go to Hyde Park and join the rest of GLF and we were arrested in Hyde Park. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we appeared in court in our drag uh, because the courts were another, uh, uh, you know, sort of theater of protest or oh, we turned it into that. Um, and, uh, Two of us got off and uh, two of us were found guilty of breaking the peace or something like that. Uh, there's a photograph now just come up, I see, of my arrest and the, the arrest of Nicholas Bramble, who was the spirit of Paul in Hyde Park. Um, and from there, uh, we drag queens grew closer and closer. And because uh, a lot of us had problems, not me personally, but a lot of uh, the people I was associated with had problems with landlords who threw them, uh, all my friends out of their flats for being drag queens. We went, we turned into squatting and we had a commune in Notting Hill, um, as I mentioned, um, where we joined in uh, with the, local people protesting housing conditions there and so on and, and uh, we joined the carnival of course uh, uh, that year and eventually we broke up after about nine months um, and uh, that was the end of gay liberation for me but we caused quite a stir within gay liberation by our activities many thought of us as letting the side down or appearing like people's worst nightmare of what homosexuals were like and the way they behaved. Um, we were controversial and it was all great fun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart Feather. There's a virtual round of applause from the green room for, you, uh, for Stuart there. And um, our next speaker is, is, is Ted Brown. 
um, Ted first encountered GLF um, when he was handed a leaflet outside of a cinema. Um, Ted was an active member of the GLF youth group um, and at the time they organized the first public march of LGBTQ people in the UK, um, the GLF Youth March on the 28th of August 1971. Um, Ted um, has a refutation which precedes him. He's um, uh, founder of the Black Lesbians and Gays Against Media Homophobia and um, the most notable campaign um, being that against Pato Bant um, Bio Banton and his uh, reggae song Boom Bye Bye, which resulted in the recording being uh, banned. And Ted, I believe, received a televised apology as well. Um, Ted, the, the platform is yours. Okay, right. Uh, well, I want to give an overall statement um, because uh, GLF means so much to me that if I get into a lot of detail, I'm likely to run on until tomorrow morning. So initially, I want to say that I believe that like the others here, GLF is still very high in, in my heart, in my feelings, and in my mind. It changed my life in, in many ways, and I still feel myself to be um, a GLF activist, even um, 50 years later. Um, also, a, a slight correction, because although I agree with you that the 1971 march, the youth group march against the unequal age of consent laws was the first march through central London. Uh, GLF had actually had a smaller demonstration in, um, in Finsbury Park. Uh, no, uh, yeah, was it? Uh, the Highbury very Fields, Ted. Highbury, Highbury Fields. Fields, I think. Highbury Fields, sorry, Highbury Fields. Uh, against police entrapment of men that were cottaging. And that was consisted of about 150 people. Um, it was small and it was spontaneous. The march that you speak of is the first march through central London and it presaged, pre well, came before. <laughs> I can't talk now. Um, this is also emotional. Um, to the first gay pride march, which happened a year later in 1972. So I'm going to begin by giving a slight uh, summary of the circumstances in which, uh, from which I became a GLF activist. Um, some of it may seem irrelevant, but you'll understand uh, when I get into uh, a bit more detail. I was born in 1950 in the United States of a mother who had two other young, younger children, but had divorced. She was Jamaican. She had, didn't have American citizenship but she was very much involved in the civil rights movement that was being led by Martin Luther King, uh, Rosa Parks and other notables. The FBI kept an eye on people like her and she wasn't uh, lucky enough to get her citizenship. So she was deported from the States and uh, with, with me and the, her younger children. And we wound up in Greenwich and Deptford in a small shop where we were subjected to some severe racism from the local National Front organization. They were breaking our windows. They were pushing uh, dog mess through the letterbox. They were writing uh, obscenities on our walls and so on and so forth. And my mother was able to stand this because she had experienced even worse in America, which was one of the reasons that she joined the civil rights movement. Now, I went to school in, in that area as a young child, and I think I began to have an inkling that I might be 
homosexual, because those are the only terms that were available to us in those days. When I was 1961 or so, when I was 11 years old. And people often forget how early uh, homophobia is installed in children. When I first became aware that I possibly might be homosexual, I remember reading, I think it was the D Bino or the Dandy, which featured Dennis the Menace. This may not seem relevant, uh, but I'll explain why. Because Dennis the Menace uh, was um, a boisterous character, probably everyone has heard of him, but he used to bully a character called Walter, who now has, um, in current uh, television, is now um, presented as a, a snob and a sneak and so on. But in the early days, the problem with De um, Walter was that he liked flowers and poetry. And for those reasons, it was okay for Dennis to beat him up, to threaten him, to insult him. And this was being pumped out to the kids at the time. And I was actually, oh, already? Oh my God. <laughs> Five minutes, left. okay, well, let's, let's run on through then. Uh, <laughs> I, um, my mother died in 1965, just a few months after I had told her that I, uh, that felt that I was uh, becoming homosexual. Um, she, I knew, would understand, and she was sympathetic. We cried on each other's shoulders. She said she knew that I would, was going to have to deal with racism uh, as well as hostility towards homosexual people, but she gave us me support, and she pointed out to me that when she was working with the civil rights movement that she had heard of Bayard Rustin, who was the openly gay black man who helped organize the great march on Washington at which Martin Luther King gave his, I have a dream speech. And that the civil rights movement had actually been arguing not just for equal rights for black people, but for women's rights and for sexual rights and for um, better conditions for children and so on and so forth. So I had a, a, was very lucky to have a, a good background there. I um, lived with uh, watching the television. I saw programs. If you want to have an idea of what the atmosphere was like at the time, I recommend that you watch a film called The Children's Hour, which featured um, Audrey Hepburn and Shirley MacLaine, based on a true story, and another film called Victim, which was actually used to argue against the persecution and blackmail of, of gay men, and it starred Dirk Bogard, who should get an award from the um, LGBT community for the work that he did in that film. Oh my God. Um, anyway, I um, went to see the film Boys in the Band. Um, I was very upset about it because the basic theme seemed to be that the only problem gay men have is that they, their self-hatred. It did not mention the prejudice that they, they suffered. Um, and on leaving it, uh, the Odium Lester Square, seeing this film, I came across leaflets, um, people leafleting against the movie and saying it was a distortion of gay life. I went to my uh, first meeting at the Middle Earth in Covent Garden, where I walked into a room where there must have been maybe 200 openly lesbian and gay people, something I had never seen before. And I felt welcome and very positive. Um, I joined in some of the actions that um, Stuart has spoken about, one of which I remember brightly, which was called, um, uh, in response to a book called Everything You Want to Know About Sex by a man called David Rubin, in which he claimed that typical gay sex involved inserting cucumbers an anally. So we demonstrated outside pan books, 
uh, with our eight foot long paper mache uh, cucumber, led by the editor of Gay News magazine, who bent forward and we waved the cucumber around his bottom as we rushed into the offices of, <laughs> anyway, of the uh, uh, pan books protesting against his book. There were other actions. Um, I joined the uh, Bound Green Commune. Uh, last year, I went with Dan de Lamotte, who produced the film, Are You Proud?, and found the location um, in Bound Green Road, very close to Queens Road, which was our original uh, commune lo location. And um, I, I remembered many, many events which I can enlarge upon. Uh, uh, I won't ramble on, but sorry. Yeah. Gosh, eight minutes goes. That's amazing. Across. <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? I realised when I asked you all if you would come together and reflect on your time with GLF that asking you to speak for, you know, between five and eight minutes was a was a really tall order. But I would encourage anybody who is out there watching, if you do have questions for Ted, if there's things that you'd like to know more from either Stuart or Ted, there is the um, the question box. So please do send those through, and we can we can address them later. Um, our next speaker speaker is Angela Mason. Um, Angela um, uh, was a student at LSE during the early 1970s and was active um, amongst the Gay Liberation Front women um, um, and specifically their interaction with the um, women's liberation movement as well in 1971. Um, Angela has gone on to be um, a stalwart of LGBTQ um, battles for rights and just a general, a person that has been there for this community through an awful lot of things. Um, Angela was director of, um, the, uh, of Stonewall between 1992 and 2002. Um, she was the national advisor for the Equalities and Cohesion and at the Improvement and Development Agency and was chair of the Fawcett Society between 2007 and 2013. In 2010, she was elected as a Labour councillor for Camden Borough Council. Um, Angela, platform is thank, yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Stephen. I sound like a stately homo of England. <laughs> <We're all laughs> stately now. homo of England, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you to the library, which is in Camden, <laughs> for, for organising this, this event. It, it's great and lovely to see everybody. I, I've, I actually just sitting here thinking, God, was it 50 years ago? It's, it's, it does seem absolutely amazing. And I'm glad we've all survived one way or another. Um, and of course, not everybody has, which we also, which we also remember. Um, when I think of GLF, I think of it really as a, a dazzling firework, which absolutely lit up the sky. And we never saw things the same way again. Um, and it wasn't just a rocket. There was Roman candles and casting wheels and bangers um, and a whole political extravaganza. I think it's important to remember that um, uh, some of the ways we organized, you did mention them at the beginning, Stephen, they were quite novel at the time. Um, we were much more used to the sort of organization you had in the campaign for homosexual equality, which essentially was a parliamentary lobby group or traditional uh, left-wing parties. But this was really anarchic, I think is the word, iconoclastic and freewheeling. Um, and, and sort of it was a political extravaganza, which is a sort of great sweetie jar from which you pick the thing that you, you wanted to become engaged in. And some of the things I think, I mean, we did go on demos, we had loads and loads of actions and we did do newspapers, but I think Stuart's described a little about the street theater and how challenging and uh, uh, opening out that, that was. Uh, we also had lots of things called think-ins. And I'm always trying to tell my fellow councillors now, that's what we ought to do. We ought to sit down and have a think-in. And they were great because there was an equality between everybody. Um, and whatever your background or circumstances, it was an opportunity for us all to come to grips with things that we bottled up and not talked about for the, in the main for, for most, of our, most of our lives. So, and then the other things like consciousness raising that we, I suppose, borrowed from 
from the women's movement. Um, so, and uh, Stuart said that, um, I, I didn't realize that quite, that um, I told the street theater about the Miss World demonstration. These were, this was the ar arrest and the trial at Bow Street of the women who had been in the Miss World demonstration, including me, although I wasn't uh, one of the ones arrested. Um, and uh, I have to say that um, my experience was in the women's liberation movement before gay liberation. And I wasn't, you asked us to talk about what happened when we came into the room, so to speak. Um, and um, I wasn't actually brave enough just to go to the meeting. <laughs> I, I did know, I can't remember how I knew about it, but um, I knew about the meetings of LSE. So I, I decided to go as a messenger from the women's liberation movement. And I think I um, gave greetings from the Tufnell Park Women's <laughs> Group. <laughs> And um, I think I was encouraging people to come to a demonstration. It may have been the Miss World one, I can't remember quite. But um, so I got up and I was very, very excited and nervous because I was then about 26, 27. And I had never told anybody I was gay except a psychiatrist. Um, so it was really, it was something that was in, of an enormous trouble to me and um, was, was sort of ruining my life basically. Anyway, so I got up and gave this um, message of solidarity from women's liberation. And then the chair of the meeting, who was a man called Warren Haig, do, do people remember Warren Haig? I'm sure people do, yeah. Um, uh, said, oh, well, thank you, thank you, Angela. Thank you for your message. And uh, you must remember that we have a rule here. If you speak at a GLF meeting, you have to say whether, whether you're straight or gay. And I thought, oh Christ, <laughs> what am I going to do now? <laughs> And anyway, I thought, well, I'll have to finally go for it. And so I said, I, I'm a lesbian uh, and sat down, collapsed, actually, um, and then had to have a stiff drink afterwards in the LSE bar. But I mean, it really, really, for me, it meant my life was never the same again. And I think we all shared that sort of revelatory, revelatory experience. Um, so um, although GLF was a coming together of lots of different um, political thinking. It was a very febile, quite exciting time. I mean, gay liberation, free, women's liberation, black liberation. I mean, Ted, Ted touched on this. I mean, that was also very, very important. And when we used to meet, I think uh, Stuart has mentioned as well, we used to meet in Notting Hill Gate. So there was all sorts of connections with the people who later win the mangrove trial, which has just been celebrated. On, on, on television, not, not before time. So it was a great sort of mixing of ideas. But what I think made it work was one simple, two simple ideas. That the way forward, if you wanted change, was to come out. That's what you had to do. And the second simple, but enormously powerful idea <clears throat> was that gay is good. And if you took those two, ideas together that created enormous psychic uh, emotional energy and by god we did think we could do anything and we were quite brave in a way because if you did come out in any sense you were attacked i mean there wasn't really much a, a question question about that, that about that at all um so i know um we haven't got very much time but <clears throat> i just sort of end with a couple of points i was reflecting on what was the most important, I think you perhaps asked us, Stephen, to think about what was the most important contribution of GLF. And I don't know if I've got this right, because it was so many things, but I think one of the really, really important contributions was that um, men, gay men, questioned uh, a really toxic masculinity, which was dominant. And I think that was an incredibly brave thing to do and um, was, was in itself totally revolutionary and relevant today. And um, I, I want to mention Stuart's book because there were lots of people listening and Stuart has written the most wonderful history, I think, of GLF. And there's a little bit on camp. He's actually writing on camp, but he says, uh, what oppresses men is a feudal masculinity nurtured for millennia on the ideas of military rulers. Masculinity needs new ideals, 
the 19th century gay socialist ideals were based on sandals. Modern socialism requires a masculinity poised on high heels. So I think that's a, that's a rather wonderful quote. And that was in a way the unique contribution uh, of, of gay lib. Um, you asked us two other questions. If I just <clears throat> have got time, I'll just quickly deal with those as well before I finish. One is what gay lib didn't do. And I'm not going to go for that one because I think um, there was so much actually that gay lib did do. And although I've used the analogy of a firework, which obviously explodes in the sky and then it's gone, um, the, it, gay lib absolutely left an, a, an important legacy. We had gay news, the wonderful Andrew Lumsden, and also Dennis Lemon, um, which was re really, really important. We had all sorts of new pubs and clubs. We had groups, we had networks. And I don't think that we would have been able to, and particularly men would not have been able to respond as well as they did to the advent of AIDS, which we're all thinking about now with um, the new Russell Davis show on TV. Um, and if you think about that show, even the couple of episodes that have been now, th those men came out to a scene and the fact there was an open scene is one of the legacies of, of G, GLF. And uh, you mentioned that I, I think later came director of Stonewall. Um, and there's a, sometimes Stonewall is seen as the antithesis of gay liberation, not really revolutionary. But I think in fact, that whole process of coming out of people being able to be proud of ourselves is what made the work of Stonewall possible. That'll finish that, <laughs> as you've given me the <laughs> sign to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Angela. That was really amazing. That was really amazing. And just to mention as well, Stuart's book, uh, Blowing the Lid, um, is available through the book tab, which is on the top there, which links through to Gaze the Word. So, um, so, um, we're going to move on to our final speaker. And saving the best till last, we have, um, well, that's terrible, I shouldn't say that, because we do have a room full of um, people who are hard to beat, let's be completely honest. Um, Roz Keevney. Uh, uh, Roz um, will tell you about her encounters with GLF, and so I will just tell you what Roz has been up to since, well, briefly since. Roz is an award-winning nominated writer, poet, and a renowned pop culture critic. Um, her semi-autobiographical work, Tiny Pieces of Skull, um, which was published by Team Angelica in 2015, depicts the life of an English innocent in the late 1970s America and won the American Literary Award for Best Trans Fiction. And her collection of selected poems will be published in May 2021. Roz, the platform is yours. Gosh. Um, well, Jennifer for me was as much the people that came into my life through it as anything else. I mean, there I was, this messed up, insecure, trans, but in the closet, bisexual, but mostly virgin, 22-year-old 22 graduate student working in the British, British Library on, on William Morris's manuscripts. And I rang up GLF because I needed to sort out my life. And I went round to, to an office somewhere in Chelsea and met some amazing people who said, you need to talk to Rachel. So they rang up Rachel and I went over to see Rachel. And Rachel is Rachel Pollock, who's been one of my best friends for the whole of my life. Um, and my mentor in so many ways. Rachel is also a science fiction writer, also a poet is amazing and we were both part of the what we'd now call the trans caucus of gls but in those days it was tv straight ts because who knew um and one, but one of the good things about the caucus was that we didn't make distinctions is that if you kind of wanted to be part of the caucus and had a gender complex identity you were part of it and you hung out and we didn't diss each other for not wanting surgery on or wanting surgery or any of it we didn't diss each other we just sat around in, in rooms 
and um, smoked rather a lot of dope, I'm afraid, and wrote, I'll tell you how, what it was like. Quite recently, some of my friends, my young friends, unearthed the manifesto that TVTS Group produced back in 72, which uh, Aubrey Walter reprinted and come together. And people said, well, you, you, you helped write this rather. So I said, did I? <laughs> um, and there are phrases in it that are pretty standard me turns of phrase, but I have absolutely no memory of it because that's, if you, if you, you go with the old joke about if you, if, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't there. Well, that's kind of what GLF was like for me. Uh, it was amazing. It was spectacular. There were these wonderful meetings of inventive, angry, wishy people all jammed together in a church hall in Notting Hill, sh often shouting at each other. And for a while it radicalised me. I remember we went off to other places. Um, a bunch of us went to talk to the gay group in Birmingham. And again, I, I met a couple of people that I've known all my life. Uh, it was that sense of a moment. And like all moments for me, it ended for a bit because I got persuaded by friends that I was in thinking I was transsexual, I had a false consciousness. And that was also quite convenient because there I was wanting to have proper careers. And so I went back into the closet for a couple of years and got thoroughly miserable. And there was a point when I realized I don't have to take this. And why did I know that? Because of GLF, because of that sense that you could do what you wanted, that you could, didn't have to conform. And when I did transition, in order to get past the gatekeepers for trans hormones and surgery and all of that, back in the late 70s, there was a lot of pressure to be quiet and mousy and stealth and and, and, and drift through society as a remove. And because of GLF, I was in a position to say, well, screw that. I'm proud of who I am. And I'll always be grateful for the atmosphere and those church halls that gave me that confidence. I loved those people. I still do. Um, some of the people in the TVTS group are no longer with us. Um, a couple had rather tragic ends, in fact. And that's the thing, you, you, that world was full of people one remembers forever because it was, it was that moment, that sense of a moment that's special. Um, and I think one of the things that's important about events like this is to, is to, carry, is to carry the torch forward and, and pass it on and pass on that sense of refusal to accept second best, refusal to let anyone tell you what to do except yourself. And hey, I love you all. That's it, really. Bye. That was really beautiful. Thank you very much, Ross. Thank you for sharing with us. There's a virtual round of applause there. Yeah. Um, if you do have any questions, in um, please please use the, the the question box below. Um, I am um, in the, in the sort of spirit of, of gay lib. Um, I was going to give us five minutes, maybe, if anybody wanted to respond to anything that anybody has has said uh, amongst the four of you. If you if you if you'd um, if you'd like to to comment. Otherwise, I have a question which I would quite like to ask. <laughs> Make sure you unmute yourselves, please, as well, so we can hear you. <laughs> I'll ask my question then, shall I? Um, 
Okay, well, my question is, and actually I wonder whether our, our wonderful tech support, Ollie, might be able to show on the screen. Gay Liberation Front actually had um, a set of demands, eight demands, which they, they set out. Um, I think Angela was waving some of the uh, uh, a sort of TypeScript copy of it earlier on um, at, the, yeah. at the screen as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, th there, were, there were eight demands, and I wondered um, if, um, if, if, we can, if we can show the, the, the image of the eight demands, that would be great, um, just if people aren't familiar with them. I wondered um, if any of you had anything that you wanted to maybe say about the demands, maybe ones that were there which still you feel haven't been addressed, or if, if you wanted to add a demand maybe, what, what the demand might be. I'll start with you, um, Stuart, if that's okay. Yes, fine. Um, I mean, I, I was thinking about this, and um, I, th I decided that the, the demand that was missing, really, was the right to change gender by self-declaration, mm -hmm. the right to free physiological change, and uh, sex modification. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, there weren't very many trans sexuals in GLF um, and we had then very strange ideas really about who we thought transsexuals were. I used to think um, they were you know they were really black and white um, straight um, homosexuals who who couldn't uh, bring themselves um, uh, to uh, recognize themselves as homosexuals and therefore um, they sort of decided they were women. Of course, it's, it's ridiculous, but that's the way we thought and uh, certainly the way I thought. And uh, also, I think there was a great deal of confusion in those days between what uh, or who transsexuals are and what transvestites are. I think, uh, I think a lot of people were really confused about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so that was uh, my idea. That was um, your demand that you would add? I, I think that that's would be my question. demand, yes. Yeah. Ros, did you want to come in on that? Well, or, there's, um... no, there's an old joke in the community about what's the difference between a transvestite and a transsexual about six months. Um, <laughs> well, that's the thing. <laughs> um, but uh, Ros, how did how did you feel about the um, the demands? Anything that you would add, or I don't. Really, they were solid stuff. I mean, obviously, access to access to surgery was indeed a utopian demand um, because back then it's the even now you've got people trying to demand that access to surgery be removed, that right self-identification such as it is be removed. There's a major campaign going on about that against us. Um, one of the things that I really welcome is the solidarity of old GLF people against that nonsense. But it's from people who ought to know better. It's people who were there in some cases. Um, but it's also the assumption that, well, I say the assumption that trans people are straight. I assumed I was straight. I was, I, I was, you know, well, I was straight. I was, when I transitioned, I had sex with guys and I got bored um, in sort of sense. Um, um, Ted, you're still on mute. Would you like to say anything about the, the demands or? Um... <laughs> Angela, maybe you'd like to say something while Ted on you. Okay, I'll just say, uh, well, what, the bit of paper I was waving around says the mm. principles of the Grey Liberation Front, and then it's got the eight demands, as you say. Mm. But there's a whole point uh, argument in front of the demands, and that is all about solidarity with other movements. Mm -hmm. And it says GLF therefore sees itself as part of the wider movement, aiming to abolish all forms of social oppression. Mm -hmm. It will work to ally itself with other oppressed groups 
whilst preserving its organizational independence. In particular, we see these groups including, and there's a list, women's liberation, black people and other national minorities, the working class, young people who are rejecting bourgeois lifestyle, people oppressed by imperialism. And I think uh, that um, situation of gay liberation and our concerns within the context of a more general struggle for liberation and against oppression is something that's rather died away and makes it actually more difficult for us to I think form form alliances and explain some of the rather bitter disputes that um, now now go on. Mm -hmm. Ted, how about you? Yeah, yes, um, I agree. I mean, uh, it was one of the points I tried to make earlier about the civil rights uh, movement. Um, one of the ways in which we are oppressed is by the technique of divide and rule, mm -hmm. where each group seems to be fighting for their own little area. And one of the things that the civil rights movement recognized, and um, for example, the Black Panther Party uh, realized, is that we're all in this, truly all in this together. And that to sum it up, there is no freedom for anyone while any of us are oppressed. Mm. Now, um, one of the ways that we have this successful divide and rule is that people are under the impression that the civil rights movement or the women's movement are only fighting for their own particular corner. Mm. And, but GLF showed that that was not true. Everyone knows, for example, about uh, GLF support the minors. Mm. Um, you know, people were very surprised and they recognized that the economic oppression and the uh, business oppression that miners were suffering was as much um, a cruelty and injustice as um, the oppression of women, the oppression of gay people, the oppression of, of black people. Mm, yeah. um, so That's great, you know, thank you, Ted. It actually looked that you've actually answered quite a few of the questions which have come through from members of the audience, um, many of which are talking about what is the significance of being of gay liberation over, um, over, over gay rights. So what is the difference in that vocabulary? And I think what you've articulated really well there is this idea of it's the liberation of the self rather than legislating for, for change. Um, it's both. We've both. Also, sorry, both. sorry, go on, Angela. I, I think it's not one or the other. I mean, it's mm. both. Oh. And, and mm. the actual demands a very sort of liberal reformist demands of you mm. not to be discriminated at work, to have an equal mm. age of consent. They're all the sort of actually bread and butter of what Stone will actually mm. uh, set out to do and, large, and largely did. Um, mm. But th th so you don't need to see those, those issues as separate from a wider struggle for liberation. In well, my view. Another question that we've had in from Rachel is, um, how did gay liberation interact with women's liberation? Were there many lesbians involved in both? Um, I don't know whether, Angela, would you like to maybe? Um, well, there was that? quite a strong interaction. There were lots of, quite a lot of women in uh, gay liberation, some of whom have been uh, in women's, like myself, in women's liberation, but certainly, certainly not all. Um, and I suppose one of the early strengths of gay liberation was that it was for men and women. It was men and women working together and as I've tried to suggest in a very sort of poignant and meaningful way at least to me but those those as everybody will know there were fantastic uh, discussions and differences about whether women should remain working with the men or they should go off and organize separately mm -hmm. and uh, I on the whole was of the view <laughs> although I'd come from the women's liberation movement that women should um, uh, not separate from the men. However, and there was uh, Elizabeth Wilson, who you quoted earlier, who I have to declare as my partner, actually. So, <laughs> amongst other things, the women gay liberation movement gave me a partner uh, for 50 years, which is not bad. Um, she, she's always argued that, um, in fact, um, in a way, some of the men were sort of using radical feminism to push the women out, encourage them to, to go out. And these are all topics that. Uh, Stuart deals with in his book. So I think one has to say that the relationship wasn't really resolved. <laughs> there, were, there were conflicts, but I think there was a common understanding of the oppression of 
very stereotyped gender norms, the way that was expressed in the family, the way it was expressed often in schooling and in education. So that was that was common ground and an important sort of new development in politics in, in, in this country. But neither, uh, I think, transgender issues were entirely resolved by, I don't know what Ros thinks, by, by gay liberation. Um, there was no arguments about that and about transgender people coming to the women's group. Because I, I was one of the ones who started the women's group in GLF because I thought we ought to uh, be able to meet separately as well. Um, so, and these arguments continue. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing if we can do it with slightly less acrimony than um, is happening at the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone else like to comment, comment on the relationship well, between gay live and women's live? Ros? I, I was just going to say, if you look at the, uh, come to get the document that doesn't come together, one of the points that's made in there is what we now call intersectionality, that trans identities, particularly trans women's identities, were, you know, our, our destiny is closely bound out, up with women's liberation, whatever, the, whatever that relationship ends up being. There is no liberation for us without women's liberation. It's as simple as that. And we, were saying, we were saying that in 1972, and we're saying it now. Yeah. It's amazing how these things come around in, and so many of these things come around in cycle, these issues come around in cycles. Stuart, Ted, did you have anything that you'd like to say about Women's Lib and GLF? <laughs> yes. Um, I remember that there was an ongoing argument about um, using the term gay for women. A lot of the women felt that they were being disappeared uh, by having to use the term uh, gay instead of instead of lesbian. Uh, there was a point uh, at which the women left um, some of the meetings at, um, at Notting Hill, I remember, in particular, because what we have to remember is that the oppression works within all of, all of us in some ways. And many of the men and many of the gay men in GLF had the same attitudes that many heterosexual men had, but we would have occasions where there would be a break in meetings and the men would sit back expecting the women to make the tea. <laughs> you know? And we had, that's what the thinkings were about, looking at the, the minutia of, of, the, of, of oppression and of stereotyping and of the limitations that, that we were all living under and sometimes weren't aware of. So. And Stuart, would you like to? Things, the, well, the I, great, oh. greatest achievement was getting people to look at themselves and the society at, from every single angle possible and to try to change them because those are the ways that we are oppressed. I think on what you were saying about um, gay women, I think was really a generational thing. Uh, because uh, since we've been using the word gay, um, which I think really began in the 1930s in America and came over here, um, first of all, with those who could afford to travel to America in the 30s, gay men uh, or women, and um, that we, we, we talked about gay men and gay women in those days. And right mm. at the beginning of GLF, it was gay men and gay women. And uh, what happened in Notting Hill was really the younger generation of um, radical feminists who uh, wanted, uh, uh, who were proud of the, uh, les of being called, they wanted to be known as lesbians. And so, um, but I don't think any of the um, older women objected to that at all. Uh, because they were as proud of being lesbians as, as were the younger ones, really. Um, it's one of the things that I find really um, fascinating as a librarian, especially working in an organisation like the British Library, is the ever-evolving nature and power that right. words can have. Mm. It's, 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 it's incredible. And it's actually um, one of the things that really attracted me to uh, GLF when I first encountered them was the use of the word gay. And I found it so 
confusing in a way to think of gay women rather than lesbians. So even within my sort of generational knowledge, I, I found that connection quite strange to make at first. I just wanted to mention before we move on to the next question that, that we do mention Come Together quite a few times and you can also from the bookshop at Gaze the Word purchase this wonderful Verso edition of Come Together, which was the official newspaper of official. Anything official <laughs> in gay <laughs> agenda? It was the newspaper of gay liberation <laughs> friends. Um, and this is a compilation of all of the issues which was compiled by Aubrey Walter. Uh, and this new Verso edition is really lovely, but you can oh. you can pick that up from Gays the Word as well. The women all did um, a gay uh, come the women all did come together. We did a whole women's come together. That's right, right, yeah, that's right. Where yeah, there was all, a women's issue of come together. That's where we right. all dressed up as sort of I don't know, men <laughs> actually. <laughs> Um, we've had, we've had, um, I'm going to have this as our final question, and I think it's kind of pertinent given that um, Gay Liberation Front was, was organising up until sort of like late, late 1973, early 1974 in London anyway. Um, could we maybe think about or, or say something about the relationship between GLF and the regions? So GLF London, we, everybody um, who's here tonight was, was part of of GLF London. But I wonder if any of you had any thoughts on how GLF London impacted on the UK maybe more broadly? Well, Anyone? I was similar, at the same time I was coming to GLF meetings, I was very involved with gay action in Oxford. Um, and again, there was a small, there had always been a, a CHE group in Oxford and we were the annoying radicals um, who found various aspects of CHE unappealing. Um, and CHE is Campaign for Homosexual yes, Equality, yeah. just in case, in case yeah, the acronyms. <laughs> yeah, group organizer, group, group organizers, sexual privileges. Um, those. Um, there was that. And then I was involved with uh, the group in Leeds. Uh, which was when I was living in Leeds in, in 70, 73, 74, which was just like a small, a, a, sm a very small group, group meeting of GLF, only it was taking place in someone's living room in Leeds, having the same arguments, the same rows. Um, Anybody else, any thoughts on the I, I seem to remember spending an awful lot of my life in a van going up and down <laughs> trying to spread the cause of liberation. And we did go up to lots of Bradford, Burnley, uh, Preston. Uh, we were always going up to sort of zap. I think that's what various things and to express solidarity. Um, and later on, when I was at Stonewall, um, I went, I went to, to out of London all the time. And it was very interesting. So you did see, I remember going to Birmingham for the first Pride. And one of the great things that had happened this, uh, was that uh, the a major cafe meeting place in Birmingham was actually, actually had windows for the first time. And so many, when you went up to, uh, out of London, there were an awful lot of places. There were sort of odd pubs, clubs, but they were all hidden away. There were no windows. You couldn't, they, you couldn't see out and nobody could see in. I mean, so I think one, it was perhaps a shock to sort of me in London, you know, how tough and closeted things, things were for a very long time. And I was just looking up some statistics that Peter sort of put out. In 1989, there were 3,000 men arrested for criminal offences. You know, <laughs> things were tough and, and, and gay liberation didn't knock down all the, all the, all the barriers uh, all, all in one go. It took, it, it's been quite a long process actually, but quite a exciting one. <laughs> I mean, the fact that- Yes, I remember, uh, sorry, Ron. But the fact that one of the demands is about the police and about the police just staying out of people's lives is actually now in the, in the now we're actually talking about defund the police as a political slogan can you imagine Stuart you wanted to say well, something about well I, I was just going to say um, I, I remember that we had a, a national thinking in Leeds uh, in 1971 
uh, mm -hmm. with uh, both um, GLF and CHE um, because there were like no GLF um, groups in Manchester or uh, they were all CHE groups there. It did become a clash between CHE and uh, uh, GLF. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I, yes, I remember Burnley particularly where we were invited to go and uh, help Burnley who had got into um, difficulties um, in, uh, well, CHE in Burnley uh, got into difficulties uh, because they, they had an idea of opening these clubs there and right at the last moment, um, a couple of priests, a Roman Catholic and an Anglican, uh, got word of it on the local radio and um, persuaded the cooperative society who were going to lease out uh, one of their properties for the club and uh, forced them to, or persuaded them to um, withdraw the offer. Um, and we went to Edinburgh, I remember that too, um, where we took part in all the Travers trials at, at the Travers Theatre where they had uh, meetings on controversial issues and they had um, oh, uh, academics from um, uh, Edinburgh University and uh, professional psychologists giving their versions and uh, I remember Andrew Lumsden particularly speaking so well at that um, at that meeting. Yeah. Ed, so, any, any thoughts that you'd like to share with us about um, GLF outside of London? Any thoughts or um, did you did you get to leave London at all or were you very much the a Londonite? <laughs> uh, no, I was I was very much a Londonite. Um, I think I think one of the th ways in which I became aware of how different things were outside of London was the short stint that I had working for Gay Switchboard, um, because there were people who would call and um, not jokingly feel themselves to be the only gay in the village, and in in many ways technically they actually were. And the kind of support that we gave to people was very important. I mean, it's, it's no underestimation to say that we saved um, several people's lives, people mm. who felt that they were at the end of their, their tether. Mm. Um, I didn't go outside of London very much myself, except with my partner, who, uh, who stemmed from, from Birmingham. And he remarked to me when we met some of his gay friends, that he sensed a different attitude in them coming out to what he, he normally, uh, experienced in London. Um, and he tried to, tried to ensure himself that he wasn't being elitist, but I, I, felt, it, I felt it too. It, it, There's it, so much still to think about, isn't there, about how that relationship how all of our relationships as um, with ourselves as as I'm going to use the word queer identified oh. people to, to yes. capture us all under an umbrella, how we all found our ourselves in these kind of systems which maybe weren't built for people like us. And I include that as myself as being somebody born in 1980 as much as <laughs> as much as for the for, for <coughs> UGLFers as well. Um, we've we've run slightly over time and I hope nobody out out, out, out away from our group is offended. I've had a really lovely evening um, hearing your reflections and, um, and talking with you. So I'd like to thank you very, very much for, for giving your time and um, sharing with all of us uh, your, your, your thoughts on GLF. So thank you very much to our panelists um, and thank you very much to our audience for attending as well. Um, please do keep an eye on our what's on pages for other things which are coming up at the library over especially the course of February. Some, some, some events which might pique your interest if you come to uh, Gay Liberation Front Reflections are Life Drawing with Alison Beckdale, which will be happening on the 17th of February, and Molly Houses and Madams, which will be happening with Mark Ravenhill on the 16th of February.
Um, please do send us some feedback forms as well. We would love to hear what you thought about today's event. It will help us to, to sort our scheduling programs for our cultural events in the future. Um, again, thank you very much to our panelists and thank you all very much for joining us tonight at the British Library.